My name is Jenny Hannafin. I'm an archive assistant at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery, and I'm going to tell you a few things you probably didn't know about Virginia H. Corbett. Virginia Corbett joined the faculty of Colorado Agricultural College in 1900 as a professor of literature and history. She would go on to serve as an instructor for 32 years and as the Dean of Women for 24 years. Virginia was also an active member of the campus community, known for creating the Women's Government Organization, the Associated Women Students, and starting a loan fund in 1911 that helped women pay for their education. I'm going to spend a little time on the years prior to 1900, which is when she came to Fort Collins. I'll provide an overview of her career at CAC. And lastly, I'll investigate the time she spent in China in 1923 and unwittingly became a witness to one of the biggest natural disasters of the 20th century. Virginia was born in Winfield, Iowa on February 13, 1867. She received her bachelor's degree from Iowa State College in 1893 and in 1908, her Master's of Philosophy from the same institution. Her undergraduate thesis was the Faust Legend in Literature. So that's her circled in the middle on a student roster and her circled on the right um, shown with her thesis title. Virginia taught grade school in Hebron, Nebraska and York, Nebraska. She was also for two years the assistant state superintendent of Nebraska, and this was during the time that her brother, H.R. Corbett, was the superintendent. She also taught for a year in Iowa and completed a year of graduate study in Chicago. So that is her on the left um, when she was at Montana State College teaching English and history, and that is probably the earliest portrait that any of us in Fort Collins have seen of her. So in 1900, Virginia was 33 years old and she came to Fort Collins and joined the faculty at Colorado Agricultural College. She taught history and English and in 1904, she was named professor of literature and history. She wrote a letter back to her alma mater, Mon Montana State College, and it was published in the College Exponent and she told a story uh, about how she was assumed to be an instructor in the domestic science program by virtue of her gender. Quoting the article here, Miss Corbett says she did not like to inform him of his mistake, but duty whispered low she must, and she did. In 1908, Virginia was made Dean of Women and she received her master's degree from Iowa. Her thesis there was on women's work at land-grant colleges. The book, Democracy's College in the Centennial State, tells us that before World War I, Miss Corbett would regularly be seen guiding a college horse in Surrey through the streets of Fort Collins en route to an appointment with women from the college. That's her in the picture in the upper right. It's an event at Colorado Field in 1915 She's the one uh, with the black muff on her arm. And 1915 was also the year that she received her PhD from the University of Chicago. Virginia became an established leader, not just at the college, but in the community of Fort Collins at large. This anecdote was published in the 1960s, that's on the left there, in an article called The University Tradition, and it tells us that Miss Corbett, a daughter of the Victorian age, was regarded by those who knew her as a sort of personification of the virtues of that age. Old fashioned and perhaps a bit stuffy, yet remembered affectionately for her gifts of humor and human sympathy. So in 1922, Virginia spent a little time at Boston and Wellesley Colleges on the East Coast, and it's probably there that she learned about Ginling College in Nanjing, China, and decided to teach there. As a woman of religion, Virginia was probably inspired by the social gospel movement. Much of America's involvement in China at this time was an expansion of the earlier Christian missionary impulse. 
So Virginia got her passport on June 12, 1923. That's it there in the upper left-hand corner. And she sailed on August 23, 1923 on the steamship President Lincoln. And that's shown there at the bottom. So she had planned to stop in Tokyo on the way to China, but she would have no way of knowing that she was sailing towards the aftermath of one of the most destructive earthquakes of all time, the Kanto Daishinsai. The great Kanto earthquake happened in the Tokyo Yokohama metropolitan area at two minutes before noon on September 1st, 1923. It was a magnitude 7.9 earthquake and it killed 140,000 people. It burned two cities to the ground and unleashed tsunamis, floods, mudslides, and avalanches. What you're looking at here are pictures from an album compiled by Vera Talbot, which is housed at the International Center for Photography in New York City. Note that the Talbot images are from more than a year after the earthquake. Virginia's ship arrived 12 days after the earthquake, and Yokohama Harbor was still in chaos. These images here give a sense of the disaster. They're all from the Smithsonian. Virginia sent a letter home, uh, written on September 13, 1923, which was later published in the Rocky Mountain Collegian. Her ship spent three days in the harbor, and Virginia tells us that they, quote, anchored three miles from the dock, but dead bodies floated by at that distance, giving a hint of the gruesome conditions on shore, end quote. Virginia also told a few survivor stories of escapes and catastrophes, including an anecdote about a woman who lived for five hours on the water by floating after having dived under the flames on the water and swum out far enough to escape them. At the end of that letter, Virginia wrote, I don't know how long we may be delayed at Kobe, but we can't reach Nanking now in time for the opening of the college. So just a little bit here about what Nanjing, China was like in the 1920s. So in the town and the country, girls had little access to formal education and their feet were still being bound. There was anxiety that uh, Chinese nationalism nationalism could be whipped up against Americans at any time, as indeed happened in Nanking, but that wasn't until 1927 when Virginia had already left. Americans were just getting some sense of rural life in China at this time. Understanding of this area of China would greatly increase in 1931 when Pearl S. Buck's The Good Earth was published. So Ginling College was an American missionary college, and women's colleges like Ginling offered young women opportunities that had previously been available almost exclusively to male students. Ginling graduated its first students in 1919, and it was the first college that gave American bachelor's degrees to women in China. So Virginia did not make this procession shown here at the upper left that's a procession from October of the year she was supposed to be there, but was delayed, uh, obviously, because of the disaster in Tokyo. And the other images are from Ginling College of the 1920s. These are from Yale University's Divinity Library. Um, and the information that I got about Ginling is from Barnard College of Columbia University in an online exhibit called A View from Ginling that was just posted this year. So these are all pictures of Ginling College, and in the middle there is an article that was published in the Collegian. So Virginia wrote about her experience there in February of 24, and it was published in the Collegian in July of 24. And Corbett told people back in Fort Collins that the girls she met at this college were remarkably like our own American girls. And here's a quote. All the girls were fitting themselves to be doctors, evangelists, YWCA secretaries, or social service workers, all for the benefit of China. Before we leave Ginling College, just a few more images in the upper left are graduates from the 1920s. 
bottom um, two pictures are of the campus and of a procession. In the upper right is a picture of Wu Yi Feng, a member of the first class of 1919 Ginlin College and later president of Ginlin College. So Virginia returned to Fort Collins and back to the work she had undertaken before her trip. From 1924 to 1930, she returned to teaching, administrative work at CSU, and helping with the Associated Women Students Organization, that government organization, and Alpha Chi Omega, which was a national journalism organization for women. She also contributed to community-wide organizations like the YWCA and the PEO. Her health declined around 1930, and she passed away two years later. Virginia died at her home at 428 West Laurel Street on February 11, 1932, and a big memorial service was held at the college campus with remarks given by President Laurie. Pictured here are on the bottom left, George Glover, who was a, a longtime friend of hers. The memorial publication tells us that he was friends with Virginia Corbett from the time she came to the campus in 1900. On the bottom right is Inga Allison, who was a friend and also a former roommate of Virginia Corbett's. And the top picture is, of course, a picture of Virginia Corbett not long before she passed away. In the words of her friend, Miss A.B. Curtis, Virginia Corbett left quite a legacy, and Virginia gave freely of her strength and time and thought with that lovely kindliness and goodness which we shall not ever forget. Thank you so much for listening and many thanks to all the archives who contributed to this presentation and that would be Iowa State University Archives, Montana State University Archives, the International Center of Photography, the Smithsonian, and Yale University Divinity Library.